Okay, thank you for coming to join us again today for our social justice faculty lecture series where we have a series of uh, professors come and talk about really important and salient issues happening right now in society. Thank you so much for joining us. We have an amazing faculty member here today who uh, her name is Dr. Kathleen Fultz, and she is a professor in the MCB biology department. She also teaches in the College of Creative Studies. So I'd like to give a virtual hand to, to Dr. <laughs> Dr. Fultz, and, and thank you so much for joining us today. Great. Thank you, Marcus. It's really my pleasure to be here today. Um, as we're all getting used to Zoom and, and doing things remotely, um, it's been in some ways good because we feel like we can reach out to more people but on the other hand i really miss uh, seeing students in person and kind of having that feedback as i go so i hope that you'll feel free to uh, put questions in the in the q a and we'll address those at the end and uh, you know you can always follow up at my email as well I wanted to just um, thank Marcus for inviting me today as a, an opportunity to talk to you about a topic that's really important to me personally, but also really relevant for the current day and age. And I think something that certainly every science student should know about. And I was instructed to give you just a little bit of my background, um, just to kind of give you a sense of where I'm coming from on this. I am a professor in MCD biology. And I study basically how cells divide and how eggs into embryos. So I'm a very basic biologist in that regard. I do a lot of molecular biology and cell biology, and I've, I teach a variety of classes, including an oncogenesis class, which is an advanced cancer biology class. And I'm also really interested in science leadership. And so I teach in a couple of courses that uh, may be of interest to students in that regard. And then I'm also very interested in how science intersects with the humanities and the social sciences. And I wanted to make uh, folks on the call, particularly students aware of the medical humanities initiative on our campus, and also how to access a list of non-STEM electives in the medical humanities. So if you have an interest in that, um, you can find a variety of courses, including ethics courses, bioethics courses that I think are very important. So with regard to my research and teaching, I have this kind of common thread of really trying to think about how students learn and what they're interested in and why and, and how to make the science relevant to their everyday lives. And this is important to me personally. I grew up um, on a small dairy farm in the Rust Belt in Ohio and I'm a first gen uh, college student. And so I'm always thinking about students lived experiences and their journey through a, through the education system and how to help them thrive in science. It's just really important to me personally, and that has a lot to do with why I'm here today and really happy to share um, my knowledge about uh, cancer biology and a remarkable woman that I'm really happy to talk to you about. So we're gonna talk about the legacy of Henrietta Lacks. And Henrietta Lacks is a person that, again, I, as I mentioned, I think every science student should definitely know about because almost everything that we think we understand about cells and particularly cancer biology comes from cells that were unknowingly donated by this remarkable woman. And I wanna tell you about two stories. One is the cancer story and one is the story of Henrietta Lacks and where they intersected. So I'm gonna start with the cancer story and I'm calling it the noble quest. And I think probably most of us on the call know someone who's battled cancer or battling cancer. And I want you to think about it as a problem, as a, as a question, what is it? What causes it? How can we study it so that we can detect and treat it? And can we prevent it? And I'm showing here a photograph of a mouse, a pair of mouse lungs. And I think you can easily see that the lung on the right has terrible tumors in it. These are metastatic melanoma tumors. They don't look all that different in a mouse than they do in a human. And this is generally what will cause death, the metastatic disease. So the sooner you can catch the disease, the better the chance of treating it. 
But think about it from the perspective of how to actually study it as a biological phenomenon, as a, as a medical phenomenon. As far back as written history, cancer has been described historically. So it's been a long time uh, focus of interest for physicians and then scientists, but it's really only in the last 50 years or so that we even have a smidgen of an idea about how it forms and some recent breakthroughs in how we can treat it. So it's been a really big science question and a really big challenge for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's important because it's the second leading cause of death in the US today. These are statistics from the CDC and comparing 2017 and 2018 uh, leading causes of death per 100,000 folks in the US population. So heart disease is the number one cause of death in the US and cancer is number two. These numbers always fluctuate a little bit and these are the, the most up-to-date data. Uh, there's an interest in what's going to happen with the 2019 data because opioid cause, uh, opioid uh, mediated deaths have increased, which changes some of these numbers. And of course, COVID will um, affect some of this as well in the future. But you can see that cancer, which kills about 600,000 people a year in, 20, in 2018, is definitely where we need to put a lot of attention. So let's go back to the mid 20th century, which is where this story begins to intersect with the Henrietta Lacks story. In the mid 20th century, around 19, right after World War II, right, early 1950s, think back to maybe what was known and what wasn't known at that time. Very little was known about basic cell biology, genes, DNA replication. We knew DNA was the genetic material, but it wasn't until 1953 that Watson and Crick published their paper on the double helix, and we began to get a sense of how DNA replicated and what the nature of the gene was. There were hints that damage to DNA was linked to cancer. So anything that mutagenizes or changes the DNA often would cause a cancer. So there was a link there between DNA damage and cancer, but there were really no treatments. It was a kind of hit or miss type of thing. And in fact, surgery was for many years, the main approach to treat cancer. Diagnosis was difficult until the tumor was fairly large. Radiation became, uh, you know, pretty common as a standard treatment in the 50s. But chemotherapy really didn't come along until much later. And the first chemotherapeutic experiments were in the late 40s on childhood leukemias, where they were testing actually biological warfare drugs on kids. This was pre-NIH, pre-F. FDA, and just seeing if they could eke out just a few extra weeks of life on these childhood leukemias. And there's the report in 1947 from Farber, which is the first chemotherapy report, where they extended the life of a cohort of eight children by six weeks, and it was touted as a massive breakthrough. And this just, I'm relaying this because I wanna give you a sense of just how little we knew in the mid 20th century and how few weapons there were available to really try to treat cancer. And I'm sure many of you know about Siddhartha Mukherjee's book, The Emperor of All Maladies, A Biography of Cancer. If you're interested in just learning about the history as well as the science, but told in a way that really uh, reaches a broad audience, I highly recommend this book. And we actually read this book in, in parallel with primary literature papers in the honors class that I teach. So in that period of time then, what scientists were trying to do was figure out some standardized way of being able to study cancer. At the point where they were at, they really had to just rely on a patient coming in and they would do a biopsy and try to figure out what was going on with the cancer. And around this time, 
there was a huge interest in trying to culture cells in the laboratory so that you could have standardized assays that would allow them to test drugs. You can imagine that being able to routinely have the same cells available to you would give you, you know, a, a standardization approach to cancer that just hadn't existed up until that point. And so the big goal was to try to get cells to grow in a dish. And I'm showing a picture here of mouse cells. If you just isolate mouse skin cells and try to grow them in a dish, on, this is what they look like on the left. They kind of flatten out and they'll lay down on the plate. But then after a very few cell divisions, they enter what's called senescence and they eventually die. And I'm just showing that here on the right as a comparison. And the blue is um, a color change that occurs because they start making a particular enzyme and you can put a substrate in there and see the color change as they're going through senescence and then dying. So there was really no good way to keep these cells going in culture. And they had spent decades trying to perfect cell culture media that would allow them to grow these cells. And mammalian cells in particular were incredibly difficult to isolate and keep alive. And there were no human cell lines at this time. So the, the point for the scientists was to try to get cells that would live forever in culture so that they would have a way to study them. And so what was happening was that uh, physicians would do biopsies on patients, and then they would take those cells and try to grow them in the lab. But at that point in time, there was no informed consent. There was no discussion of what would be happening with those cells. And here's where our story intersects with Henrietta Lacks, the unknowing donor. So Henrietta Lacks is the great, great granddaughter of a slave. And she was born in Virginia, near Roanoke. And in 1951, after World War II, she moved with her husband to Baltimore, Maryland, where they were raising a family. And she was 31 years old at that time. And she was a mother of five young children. And after the birth of her fifth child, just a couple of months, uh, she, she wasn't feeling well. And she went to her family physician who referred her to a specialist at Johns Hopkins University Hospital. And this was one of the few hospitals that was actually um, able to uh, open its doors to the larger public and in particular would take African-American patients. Not every hospital would do that. And I think you know, this is an important piece of the story to realize. So she sees this specialist at Johns Hopkins and unfortunately, she receives a diagnosis of aggressive cervical cancer and dies just a few months later despite treatment. And the treatment that she got was really the standard treatment at the time, which was a radiation type of treatment. So it, it was very hard on her. And she passed away relatively quickly. But what had happened, unknown to her and her family, was that she had donated cells from her cervical cancer. So her physician, her surgeon, Dr. Wilbur Jones, had taken a biopsy when he diagnosed the cervical cancer, and this was standard, and, would, and then took those cells and gave them to a researcher, George Gay, who was at the hospital, and who had been trying to grow cells. So they were just trying to get as many cells as they could from as many different people as they could to see if they could get them to grow. And for reasons unknown to them, and now we have a little bit of an idea about why, Henrietta Lacks cells grew and grew and they stayed alive. And it was astounding because now those researchers could study human cells in a dish. And not only that, they were cancer cells. So now they had a way to actually look at cancer cells in a dish in a standardized way. So that sounds good from the science side of things. But then what happens? Gay shares his techniques and the cells with other researchers all over the world. So you can imagine that many scientists are eager to get these cells into their labs. And 
The kicker is that the cells then start to be grown large scale and commercially sold to researchers by several companies. So by the mid 60s, these cells were being sold. And meanwhile, Henrietta Lacks' family has no idea that this is going on. But I wanna spend a moment now to talk about what we call the HeLa cell line and it's named for Henrietta Lacks, the cell line. And probably no other cell line has contributed more to biomedical science than the HeLa cell line. And I'm showing here this beautiful uh, micrograph taken by Thomas Dierink, which is Henrietta Lacks's cells in culture 20 years after she died, fixed and stained to visualize the cytoskeleton and the DNA. So kind of looking at this cellular architecture. So the, the dark blue is the uh, nucleus where the DNA is, and then this is the cytoskeleton of these cells. So they keep growing, and we learn a lot from developing, for example, vaccines. One of the challenges of developing the polio vaccine, for example, was that there was no way to grow large amounts of the virus because there was no way to have human cells to grow the virus in. And as soon as the HeLa cells became available, it was possible to begin to grow polio virus in the lab so that you could develop the vaccine. And this HeLa cells are also being used to study COVID right at the very moment. In the time since those cells were isolated, over 130,000 scientific publications exist where those cells have been used, and they are frequently referred to as the most popular cells in science. If you're a graduate student, for example, and you're learning how to do cell culture, these are often the cells you learn on because they're so robust. They're very difficult to kill, so they're easier to work with. Everything, as I mentioned, from looking at viruses to anti-cancer drug screening, effective radiation on cells. HeLa cells have gone into space to look at the effects of microgravity on cell division. Everything that we know about basic cell division mechanics and DNA replication, the telomeres and telomerase and aging studies to advances in how we image cells and do single cell experiments. And then more recently, genomic research can be traced to HeLa cells. So unknowingly, Henrietta Lacks actually has made probably the single largest contribution to biomedicine than any other person in the history of the world, if you consider her cells. But when I read the story of Henrietta Lacks when Rebecca Skloot's book came out, and I'll have some references for you at the end, this particular quote by her daughter, Deborah, really struck me. You're famous, Mama, and no one knows it. And I think this is where we want to spend a little bit of time really thinking about this and perhaps maybe the greater contribution that Henrietta Lacks and her descendants have made to biomedicine. So in 1971, I would have been in junior high at that time. There was a journal, a fairly obscure journal, Obstetrics and Gynecology, that actually named Henrietta Lacks as the source of the HeLa cell line. But not that many researchers were aware of it. And a couple of years later, members of the Lacks family learned about the cells, but no one really explained what was going on. And in fact, they asked for blood samples from the Lacks family because they wanted to compare her, her relative cells to the HeLa cell line, which had been in the lab now for 20 some years. But there was no informed consent when they asked for that. And then in 2010, so think about how many years that's been, Rebecca Skloot, who is a, a author, researched the story and the family history and it resulted in the book called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And as a result of working with the family, particularly Deborah, on telling the story, 
the family begins to learn and understand the sort of impact that HeLa cells have had. And they also begin to understand that the HeLa cells are essentially being sold and money is being made off of these cells. In 2013, just a couple of years after the publication of that book, the HeLa cell genome was determined and published without the family's knowledge. So even though there was an awareness now that the family needed to be a little more involved in what was going on in the laboratories, this was still continuing to be, you know, sort of just not even honoring the legacy of Henrietta Lacks and what the family was going through as they were grappling with some of this knowledge. So I think this is really important to note because what has happened since the 2013 publication is a really sort of engagement with the family of Henrietta Lacks in an attempt to try to change some of the uh, policies around privacy and what it means to publish a genome of a particular person, including Henrietta Lacks. And their family has really made huge contributions in this direction. And I wanna spend just a few minutes talking about that. So Johns Hopkins University, the medical school and the hospital now has um, an annual summit where they honor Henrietta Lacks and her family and, and sort of celebrate everything that's been discovered through the use of HeLa cells. And in a recent uh, session, Henrietta's granddaughter, Jerry Lax Y, really made a point that resonated with me. And I wanna actually take a moment to read it to you and then say something else. And she says, I want scientists and physicians, but I want scientists to acknowledge that HeLa cells came from an African-American woman who was flesh and blood, who had a family, and who had a story. And I think this is really important for all scientists, including myself, to acknowledge. And I wanna just take a moment to make that acknowledgement. Although I don't study HeLa cells, all the basic knowledge that I have about cell biology comes from Henrietta Lacks's cells. That is the foundation of much of my knowledge. And I want to acknowledge that and, and thank Henrietta Lacks and her family for that knowledge. So what has happened in those years since Glute's book and the ENCODE project is a real engagement with family members to really affect changes in policy on informed consent what it means to patent a gene and tissue samples, and also the Genome Information Act and privacy laws. Um, I'm not sure how much you wanna go into this and I'm happy to talk about it at the end, but the technology on genetic information and genomic medicine is advancing at a very rapid pace and it has outpaced our policies, including the Genome uh, Information Act which was set up in 2008. And I'm, I'm really just grateful to the family for pushing hard on this because it's forced lawmakers, policymakers, uh, ethicists, biologists, physicians to really you know, sit down and think about all of this and working through the NIH and the FDA now, which has much uh, more defined bioethics aspects, particularly on informed consent. But there's still a lot of loopholes. And I think it's, it's really remarkable when you go back and you think about that in 2013, the family still wasn't being informed about what was being done with those cells and particularly the genomic sequence. And I think what's also come out of this story when we think about the history of Henrietta Lacks and what her family has, has dealt with is the socioeconomic and ethnic disparities in healthcare access and environmental factors that influence human health. 
And we're seeing this, of course, in COVID as well. But I think when with regard to cancer, the data are, are pretty obvious as well. And we can talk more about some of the public health aspects of this um, at the end. But I think what, what really resonates when you look at the data is that when you have disparities in healthcare access and environmental factors that can influence diseases like cancer, you're going to see resulting disparities in cancer incidence and survival. And the data clearly bear that out. Here's some more data from the Center for Disease Control lo looking at the rate of new cancers by sex, male and female, so males and females, and um, looking at all types of cancer. And of course, if you go to the CDC's website, you can break it out um, along the lines of different kinds of cancers. And then you'll see even more differences in gender as well as ethnic background. But I think what you can see here is that there's a, a difference in the, in the incidence of cancer. Um, and this is 2017 data. These are the most up-to-date data. And this is the rate per 100,000 people. But what's really, uh, I think, telling is when you look at the rates of survival. So this is rate of cancer death. And you can see that even though, we'll go back to this one, even though if we just look at males, white and black, you can see that rates of cancer death are higher in black people than in white people. And I think the only, the only way to change that, right? We want the incidence of cancer and certainly the, the death rates to go down for everyone, right? But when you start to see differences like this, that tells you that the system is in a situation where there are disadvantages to certain people. And we're clearly seeing that in these data. So that's a problem that a basic scientist or a cancer researcher may feel like they can't really deal with, but they need to acknowledge it and, and help get the data out there and work on policies that will uh, reduce this uh, gap or difference. And I wanted to just show you this painting as a way to sort of kind of wrap things up here because I do want to spend some time fielding questions and, and maybe going into depth on things that you're more interested in. But this is a painting that was commissioned by HBO and it was through the production of Oprah Winfrey's movie about Henrietta Lacks in 2017. And some of the funds that came from that went to the family as well as commissioning this painting, which now uh, hangs in different Smithsonian museums um, at different times of the year. And it's called Henrietta Lacks, the Mother of Modern Medicine. And it was uh, made by Kadir Nelson. And it coincides, I think, really well with thinking about the contributions of a person. And of course, I knew, I learned about Henrietta Lacks as a postdoc. Uh, for many years, I didn't know the name of the person who had given rise to HeLa cells, but I knew it was a person. And learning about that person and her uh, commitment to motherhood. She was also a deeply spiritual person. And seeing this painting, I, I really want to go see it in person. So far, I haven't been able to do that. But I think for me, when I look at it and I see the flower of life, uh, you know, background here, and I think about biology and the, and the beauty of cells, and I see her superimposed on that, for me as a scientist, it really helps me remember why I do what I do. And in the September 3rd issue of Nature, which is our you know, prestigious uh, scientific journal, there's a quote from the editorial and, and the fact that lax cells were taken in a different era will never justify what those wrongs were. And the past can't be undone, but we have to acknowledge the wrongs of previous generations and those wrongs that persist today. And justice must be done and the time to start is now. And I would just add to that, that by 
keeping the story of Henrietta Lacks in mind, we can not only think about the justice that needs to be done today, but we can try to make sure that further injustice is not done by understanding the story. And so Henrietta Lacks would have been 100 years old on August 1st in 2020 this year. And what a legacy, what an amazing mother and wife and daughter and granddaughter and aunt and biomedical hero, really. So I don't want to spend too much time going you know, into more detail. I wanted to give you a chance to ask questions and we can go into detail on the things that interested you the most. But I wanted to throw a couple of references up on the screen for you. Um, and on the left, the photo is a scanning electron micrograph of a HeLa cell that has just divided. So you know, contrast that with this beautiful painting of Henrietta and there's her cells, right? Those are cancer cells. And, and for students of cancer biology, we can have in-depth discussions about whether or not a cancer is still you, but that's a different discussion. Uh, there's wonderful podcasts that you can listen to. There's a radio lab episode on Henrietta Lacks. I highly recommend the HeLa 100 website. That's the family's website. And then there's this remarkable YouTube video you can watch that was made by middle schoolers in Oakland. It's called The Immortal Rap of Henrietta Lacks. I definitely recommend this. I watch it uh, periodically. My students love it. Kids love it. And then Rebecca Skloot's book, of course, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And, and you can watch Oprah's movie as well. Um, Oprah plays Deborah, Henrietta Lacks's daughter. And then, of course, I threw in a, a couple of, um, you know, more news type articles from scientific journals. And you can easily get to the scientific papers if you are interested in that. So with that, I, I think I'll end and be willing to take questions. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about Henrietta Lacks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foltz, for that amazing presentation, especially the having that, you know, that that lens of the bio, the biological lens of how of how it happens really helped me understand that as well. So thank you so much. We have a couple of questions. So we, we can get to these questions. Great. Um, the, the first question is when did scientists start calling them HeLa cells? Mm. That's a that is a really good question. So it turns out that um, traditionally, when they would take a biopsy, they were just labeling tubes with the first two letters of the first name and the last two letters of the last name. And this would have been true for, you know, maybe the 10 patients that same day who had biopsies in that same hospital, and they would have had different labels on those tubes. And so Henrietta Lacks's tube was labeled HeLa. And one of the challenges that Rebecca Skloot had uh, in tracing the story was to try to find the paper, the original paperwork. Um, it turns out that Johns Hopkins doesn't own any of the rights to the cells. You know, they, they were just taking everyone's biopsies and trying to make those cells grow. And they were all called by those types of labeling. Um, nowadays, uh, there, there's a much different way of labeling cells. And of course, HeLa cells now have evolved over time. They've been in culture for so long, um, but we still refer to them as HeLa, but there's a lot of folklore around it. So for example, I was asking my PhD advisor, did, when did he learn about Henrietta Lacks? And he said, well, for 20 years, I thought HeLa meant Helen Lane. So there was this whole like, folkloric culture, like where did these cells come from? I mean, clearly they came from a person who had a cancer, but it wasn't widely known really until early, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, wow. So yeah, there are other cells that have these kinds of names as well that would trace back, I think, in, in the same way. Awesome, yeah. thank you. So yeah. the next question is a pretty popular question. So you mentioned that scientists have some idea now of why the HeLa cells survived and others didn't. What are the reasons? Yeah. What, what do we know so far? 
Well, without going into excruciating detail, and of course, you can always follow up with me by email if you want, and, and we can do many lectures, but um, one of the things that limits a cell's lifetime is, is maintaining the ends of the DNA. So every time the cell um, replicates, its DNA has, or every time the cell divides, the DNA has to replicate. And the mechanism of replication results in a shortening of the ends of each chromosome. And eventually that leads to chromosomal damage, which is lethal to the cell. Well, it turns out that in many cancer cells, including Henrietta Lacks' cells, uh, they have inappropriately reactivated an enzyme called telomerase, which maintains the ends of those chromosomes. So they're able to continue to divide much like your stem cells in your bone marrow do. And that's one of the um, hallmarks actually of a cancer cell. In many cases, human cancers will reactivate this en enzyme inappropriately as a way to maintain that. But we also think that HeLa cells have somehow um, acquired the ability to deal with chromosomal damage in a way that most cells cannot. And that might be why her cancer was so aggressive. Like no matter what they tried to do, it was, it was just able to overcome any kind of damage to the cell. So if you think about it, what does radiation do to cells or what does even standard chemotherapy do to cells? Well, the reason there are so many side effects is that those approaches also harm normal cells that are dividing. And what you hope is that, you know, you can kill the cancer without killing the patient. That's really kind of what it comes down to. And so for whatever reason, these cancer cells just could handle anything that was thrown at them. And we certainly see that in the lab as well. They, they can handle um, tremendous insults that other cells would just not be able to handle. So this is an, still an open question and something that um, many people are interested in, but the telomerase and the maintenance of the ends of the chromosomes seem to be a key feature. Wow, amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So much to know, so much to learn. I know, um, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so this is another good question. If immortal cells were discovered today, what are the hypothetical steps scientists would take to ethically use the immortal cells? So this is a great question, and I'm so glad you asked it because it's directly related to some of the policy changes that the Lax family has been so involved in. We now have much more transparent, informed consent. So for example, if a patient went to a physician today in the US and that physician was participating in a study where they were, for example, wanting to obtain biopsy material to see how well the cells grew in culture. Let's just say that. Uh, before they could even do the biopsy, they would have to have uh, passed their protocol through um, an agent, through a funding agency and an ethics agency that would look over the informed consent aspect of this in terms of human subject. And the the patient would have to be given lots of information about what was potentially going to happen with those cells, how they would be used. And of course, if there was going to eventually be any money made on that, including patents, they would have to either sign away those rights or they would have to um, have some kind of contractual consent there. So nowadays, it is important um, to have these in place. And it's very, but it has been difficult with a lot of stem cell research, for example, and now with genome research. So if, if for example, you're interested in your ancestry and you wanna do you know, ancestry trace using 23andMe or some commercial thing like that, when you um, spit in the tube and send them your spit so that you can get the DNA sequence, all of the legal stuff that you're signing is that you don't mind if they anonymously give your genome, sell your genomic data to companies that want it. Some of it for valid scientific research, others to try to, uh, you know, do data science to try to figure out actuarial like risks for human health and things like that. And they say it's anonymous, but it's actually fairly easy to track someone's genome down. So 
that's an area and that relates to the GINA Act I was talking about. That's an area where I think a lot of uh, folks don't understand what they're actually um, entitled to in terms of the privacy laws, even with their own DNA sequence. So for cells and tissues, it's better now than it used to be because it's sort of more obvious, but some of the commercialized genome stuff is a little dicey in my opinion. Oh, awesome, yeah. awesome, okay. Let's see, so another question. <clears throat> These are cancerous cells. So does that have any impact on conclusions that scientists gather from their research? <laughs> Uh, yes. Yeah. Do you want to come work in the lab? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> the right question to ask. So <laughs> here's the thing. The only, you know, at, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even into the 90s, the only cells we could reliably grow in the lab were cancer cells. And so we're making all these conclusions about cell biology based on, on cells that are whacked. <laughs> you know, they are, they're doing something very different. and now we have a little bit easier ways to look at cells in situ, you know, in, in the tissue, in the animal, and we have something called organoid cultures now. And there's a huge uh, branch of science now that is kind of going back and looking at some of the basic aspects of cell biology that we developed by studying cancer cells and asking, hey, if we look at it in a normal context, are there differences? And that's important because it could give us further clues into the cancer um, phenomenon in terms of what has gone wrong with a normal cell. And I think for those of you who have, have thought a little bit about cancer or had experience with it, one of the most important things to remember is that it's not a single disease, it's many diseases. And in fact, it's even unique to the person, right? So two people could have breast cancer, but they could have very different kinds of breast cancer based on the mutations. And that's what makes it difficult to treat and to study. So even the HeLa cells, if you look at HeLa cells that have been growing in Europe and were used for the ENCODE genomic project, and compare them to HeLa cells that have been growing for 20 years in a US lab on a base pair by base pair difference or comparison, there'll be differences. So they're even evolving in culture, which is kind of bizarre to think about. But yeah, that question is a great question because there are quite, you know, there are some issues with studying cancer cells and presuming that you understand normal cells because of that. Yeah. Great question. Wow. Cancer's Great. hard. It's a hard one. Yeah, these are, these are, these are tough. <laughs> it tough is ones. tough. Yeah. Okay, so we had another one come in. So has cervical cancer treatment changed since Henrietta Lacks' uh, diagnosis? Yes, and if so, <laughs> if so, to what degree did the study of the HeLa cells contribute to this? I would say that uh, Everything from developing the HPV vaccine, which reduces rates of cervical cancer, to actually drug testing um, can be traced directly to Henrietta Lacks. So uh, developing vaccines where you actually look at, you know, so there are some viruses that, that cause cancer, like some of the HPV. And being able to study viruses just in general is so, so important. And HeLa cells are critical for that because they're human cells. So a human virus can get into these cells, but they don't, those viruses have a hard time killing these cells. So it's a way to grow the virus without killing the cells. So it's very, very useful. But for cervical cancer, it's still a really um, hard cancer because there are often no symptoms until it's pretty advanced. That's similar to pancreatic cancer. Um, it's not that the cancer itself is, is so bad, it's just that it's not detected till much later um, and often is metastatic by the time it's detected. So early detection of cervical cancer through pap smears and regular gynecological checkups is, is a really big preventative thing. And HeLa cells, um, as I mentioned, were, were used in screening some of the key uh, drugs that are used to treat cervical cancer, but radiation is, and surgery are still one of the most common ones, but much more refined than they were in 1951, for sure. 
But I think development of the HPV vaccine is probably what I would say is going to save more lives than developing a new drug, actually. So prevention. Wow. Okay. Okay. So I think we have one really strong final question, and that is, what steps do you think people should take to acknowledge Henrietta's legacy and contributions to science? Well, I think a really important one is that every time we have a chance to honor that legacy as a scientist, we should do it. And one of the reasons I was so grateful to be able to talk to you today is that this is a chance for me to do that. Um, some of the premier scientific journals now are requiring that the cell lines that are being used, if they're human cell lines, particularly if they were derived prior to informed consent, that when you submit your manuscript, you have a statement in there about where these cells came from and you acknowledge the contribution of the person and, and their family subsequently. And I think that that's an important you know, sort of public acknowledgement of how a person is contributing to your work. And I think all journals should move in that direction. And scientists, um, you know, my colleagues who use HeLa cell lines um, actually really like that. They like being able to put that in the acknowledgements and have a reference to the, the HeLa uh, website, the HeLa 100 website. Wow. Yeah. And I, I think it's, you know, without, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but, you know, one of the things that really struck me when I, when I learned more of the details of, of the story, I, I don't want to pretend I know the family or anything like that, but, you know, at the, at the time that the family learned of this, um, you know, they really had very little access to good health care, like, like many people in, the, in this country. And, they they really didn't understand what the contribution had been because no one even bothered to talk to them about it. And Henrietta Lacks was buried in an unmarked grave because they didn't have the money for a headstone. And so one of the things that, that happened as a result of Sklut's book and really sort of engaging with scientists and physicians who wanted to try to at least honor Henrietta Lacks's legacy was to donate some of the um, proceeds from the book to getting a headstone. So now there's a headstone. And I actually have a photograph that I'll show. Um, there's a, this is the Lacks family that um, got together this summer for the 100th birthday on the, and you can look on the website to learn more about the family. But you know, to go and actually be able to see that at least there's an acknowledgement of the contribution that this, this woman made and what her legacy is and, you know, the remarkable descendants that she now has. And, and again, it's the family that has really pushed for some of these policy changes. And I think we want to honor them as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Dr. Foltz, thank you so much for this thank for this you. amazing conversation. Um, I learned so much just about the biological aspects, but also how they how they collide with the social and the, and the social structures that, that need to be repaired on so many different levels. So I, I, I appreciated you. this so, so much. Um, again, thanks again. Yeah. All the viewers, thank you for coming out and joining us. Joining us. There'll be more of these um, presentations happening in the future. So again, thank you for joining us and y'all have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Wow. Is that what you were hoping for, man? <laughs> oh, well, well, really well. Okay. Um,